The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. Um, and I see some new faces in the, the room, which is cool. Uh, if you don't know what the Stoa is, that's okay. Neither do I. Um, it's probably better to, to not know. Uh, but we do a lot of cool things and we have a lot of cool people visit us. And one of them uh, is Alexandra Tatarin. Um, according to her website, she's a facilitator, an artist, uh, and a pioneer in developing conversation technologies. Dang, because that's what we like doing here at the Stoa. Um, and uh, her father, uh, Doug, uh, who's uh, in the room right now, and he was part of our Wisdom Gym, uh, created the Biomotive Framework. Uh, and then I actually had a, a kind of a, a session with Alexandra, which was quite, quite great. Um, so um, I invited her to the STOA to basically talk about whatever she wanted to talk about. And luckily for us, she wants to talk about conversations and how to have really good ones. Um, so I have no idea how the session is going to uh, unfold. Uh, I, I imagine Alexander is going to share her thoughts and uh, might be some exercises, uh, but we will stick with uh, the standard Q&A format. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. I'll call on you, unmute yourself, ask your question. Um, if you want me to read on your behalf, because this will go on YouTube, I'll do that. Unless uh, Alexander wants to just break that framework, which I'm, I'm happy for that as well. So that being said, I will hand it over to her. Um, welcome to the STOA. Awesome, thank you, Peter. Um, love the STOA. So this is super, super, super great to be here. And it does feel super fitting to be here, uh, to be able to kind of dive into some of the conversations we're gonna have today. Um, thank you everyone. And thanks to a few of you guys that I know, great to see you and great to meet any new faces. And then Johnny and Noe and everyone, hi. So I kind of laughed when I was reviewing uh, what I said I was going to talk about today. Cause I said, wow, that is like the intersection of nine massive topics. Um, and here we are. So I'm going to do my best to frame and discuss kind of the larger picture and then really, really, really hammer it down to here are some takeaways that you can do uh, to better understand what's going on in your communication world. Um, I'm going to, I'm gonna veer away from uh, what you might think we're talking about today which is conversations. And what I wanna talk about is uh, collective intelligence and group mind and what that means to me. Uh, how starting to think through some of these frames can start to- uh, Ali, can I jump in? Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, it's kind of crackling your, your audio. Uh, to the point where it's just getting uh, quite noticeable. Is it happening the whole time? It's not happening what you just said right there. So it might be rubbing against a microphone or something like that. Okay, thank you. I don't know what to do about that. It, it's um, good. It's you. good right now. So whatever you're doing. Okay. Um, So who just just so I get a show of hands here, who here, there's not many faces actually, who here has exposure or explorations in the world circling collective intelligence, group minds, that sort of thing? Who who am I talking to? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So In 2013, I attended something called the Integral Living Room with Diane Hamilton, Terry Patton, and, um, and uh, 
our other find friend who runs the Evolver. And they asked the question, what is an integral conversation? And in the course of this weekend, myself and four others uh, basically, quote unquote, received a download, whatever that meant, that was a completely new term to me at the time, about what it meant to have a, an integral conversation. And one of the discoveries that I had made, we had made, that I've been kind of working on and developing over the ne next 10 years has been, it is experientially, I have experienced and recognized that we as human beings can link our minds together and uh, that we as human, I'm sorry, I'm, am I, is the microphone thing happening? No? Oh, when I unmute myself, it goes away for whatever reason. So I'll keep myself off okay. or unmuted. Okay. So the experience is that yes, we can in fact link our minds together and somehow in that download or bring down a, an intelligence or an insight or a wisdom larger than any individual mind is capable of uh, bringing down. And this is kind of a big deal. It has a lot of implications. During this um, download, uh, I basically got insights into the different roles and types that people have to be in order for this download to take place. And I got some information on what blocks or stops this type of flow from happening. So I became very interested in this. This had blown my mind into something that I had never uh, experienced before. And yet it seemed to really make sense. And being the good daughter of Doug Tatarin and my mother that I am, I also did not believe it or cling to it as being true at all until I tested it over time. And lo and behold, over time, it seemed to be repeatable. And in fact, I could uh, come in to different group spaces and explain, yeah, this is why this is working. And yeah, this is why this is not working, uh, kind of by starting from this seed download. So let me move over to my notes here. Um, Basically where I'll go with this is the world will be a very, very different place <laughs> if we are uh, consciously coming together to um, unite our minds to bring down bigger information than what we are capable of as individuals uh, that will drastically change how, how we live in the world. We did a lot of this work. I ran an art space here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And we basically did group mind work running the entire thing. We would get into a blown open state, a uh, state of prayer. I just so happened to be working with three uh, very contemplative Christians. And I, to this day, think there's something about that that seems to be relevant. I don't know why, uh, but I'm noticing a pattern, so I'm tracking it. Um, the trouble is, is most people can't get into a place where they can receive uh, these downloads, right? Yeah. So these downloads, these experiences, these modes of collective intelligences, they have been happening, I'm going to say unconsciously, under the radar since the beginning of time, and people maybe have caught on to the fact that it's happening. Maybe they haven't caught on to the fact that it's happening. 
I'm saying for whatever reason, I got the download and I'm going, this is happening, whether you notice it or not. And there's something that needs to actually be developed out of this. So problem, not every person is capable of entering into a selfless enough state or a no self enough state to be able to surrender to this process. Basically, what's required um, is you have to be able to be both a me, a fully developed me, and surrendered to the we, okay? You have to be able to be completely disidentify with your arisings. It's, it's kind of like a group Vipassana practice. And if you and four other people can be completely disidentified with your arisings, you are able to enter into an emergent state together. And in that emergent state, or a group flow state, wisdom or the muse or whatever goes, oh, hey, let's dance. Now, it's not that simple. Um, well, it is and it isn't that simple. I'm gonna rattle this off like it's no big deal. You have the ground. I'm giving away some serious magic here, people. Serious. This is literally the roots of all magic. Be aware of that. The ground, the channel. So the ground is the quiet person who doesn't talk. They're that sweet person that you never pay attention to, that you wouldn't even ever really realize is there. They're that person getting coffee in the back corner. Okay, or the girl at her notebook off to the side of the room. You have the channel, the person who doesn't shut up. I'm often the channel. Uh, shit just starts flowing out of their mouth. Okay, half the time they can't stop it. It's often women. Um, and you can have just a relationship uh, between ground and channel as well. And that's a little bit more complicated and you can really screw things up too. Next, you have the questioner. Oh, hi, Danny. The questioner is also known as the challenger. Okay. These people are often not liked. Okay. And just do a bit of a fast forward to all of the classrooms that you guys have grown up in. And there's that class clown, okay, who the teacher gets frustrated with because they're not, they're, they're, they have a problem <laughs> with everything that's being said, okay? The next is the mapper, the map maker, the person, and without this person, you are just a crazy person, very important. This person sense makes, okay, the basically when you're when you're really in a group mind process like this you are forming or you're on the, the the precipice the cusp of the edge of consciousness itself okay you are forming new morphogenetic grooves and in order for that groove to actually take across time it has to map on to previous maps already created. Does this make sense? Yeah. So what happens is someone, uh, bear with me here. Someone has a psychedelic experience. They become one with the universe. They recognize all of the amazing things about everything. And they have absolutely no schooling, no training, no scientific background, no friends, nobody to talk to. They have zero anchoring into the collective consciousness that has already substantiated itself. They are crazy and they go off in the corner, okay? They get lost, they go nuts. They're not anchored. It's very important that you have a map maker, okay? And everything that I'm saying, we're going to talk about internally as well. And then the final piece, very interesting piece, is the scribe. 
the person who writes it down and concretizes the formless. What this process is, is this is taking the formless into the form, okay? The degree and clarity through which each of these individuals, the me's within the we, can, clear, can, can do their job and that they're allowed to do their job, that's key, is the degree that uh, the, 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 the degree of precision within which that is happening is the uh, precision within which uh, that note taker, okay, I just lost my flow. Basically, the note taker has two roles. They're putting it into form. It's concretization, concretizing what is formless, but you have to be very, very careful, okay? Because there's like a space um, where if you concretize it or put it into form a little bit too early or with some weird biases, it's like molding clay that gets stuck, that, that, get, that, that, that forms in that form. And if there's anything kind of off on it, you're going to end up with problems after. So, so there's this subtle thing there. So I'm not gonna try to articulate that any further, but it's important. Um, the writing it down has to be free flow. And then, and then there's a way that you can work with that, harvest those insights to kind of concretize it in a way that creates openings for discoveries, not uh, stopping the flow. So let me just sit for a second on this. Have to remove this chat, it's fine for me. So I'm going to have the audacity to say that this um, type of experience has been happening since forever in places of gathering. Uh, but you can stop this very natural process from happening by for example, the channel might think that they're really smart and really special over time because they keep getting really wise wisdom. So now the channel is the person kind of getting all the attention, okay? And the respect. Uh, from the community or the broader public. Then that person starts to develop a certain mm, rigidness in their ego and they start becoming annoyed that someone is challenging or asking questions or asking clarifying questions. Okay. Or we don't take notes in this space, okay? I need you to just digest it, you know, empty. I don't need you to be distracted by papers. And that's okay. But you have to recognize that this is a disruption, okay? In the natural downloading process. I think I'm going to stop talking about the details of this. Um, I've given immense amount of uh, specifics and I want to perhaps contextualize it into some other frames. So for perspective, I left this integral living room Okay, I as a meditator, I'm a meditator. I've been meditating. It's my job 
it's my practice to recognize what's arising, notice when I'm putting it into a narrative, let that narrative go and be with what's arising in the next moment, don't concretize things too early, so on and so forth. I, and then I ended up staying by coincidence because I heard about this thing called circling and it sounded kind of similar to this other thing that I had heard that, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So now I have this huge experience where like massive life transformations are happening, insights are taking place. I'm like, wow, everything, wow. So I decide I'm gonna come back home and teach this to people, okay? And believe it or not, the first few times I taught it, I taught it to, I, I worked with people who were all meditators. So actually we did get into some pretty deep spaces and that was really, really great. And then I was like, okay, I have this really cool idea. Uh, I want to create an online community worldwide where we are, you know, learning about different facts and things, uh, ways of being, we get into interpersonal spaces, we challenge each other, we grow, we become these new wise beings and new interesting insights and downloads for the universe manifest through us and we take them into massive action into the world. Woohoo, that's my dream. And then I would start running these groups and it would just like end up with like people like fighting or like, I would say something and they would like get destroyed and they'd, I'd find out that they're in therapy was my dad, you know, uh, you know, processing all of the stuff that came up in, in these groups that I ran. And I was like, oh, this is weird. This is not what was happening when I first learned this stuff. Um, why? <laughs> and so thus began my descent into the regular world of trying to figure out uh, why there was such a huge gap between this amazing experience that I had that was repeatable uh, to normal communication. So now what's basically happened is I've spent the last five years obsessing <laughs> over uh, communication strategies. And now people reach out to me and I'm like, here's what's going on in your relationship. This is why you and your partner are struggling to understand each other. And I'm doing coaching in that world. So it's a bit of a hilarious jump. Um, I'm gonna say a couple more things and then I think we'll go into questions or dialogue. Um, collective intelligence. There's basically robotic mechanical cl collective intelligence, different than biomechanical collective intelligence, which is different than we space which is different than group mind, okay? These terms and words often get used synonymously uh, or in random ways. In my world, I've parsed out, they're very, very different. Don't confuse them. Mechanical collective intelligence is when you surrender your I, your me, to the we. A really good Zen monastery, like a good one, an actual one, you disappear, okay, into the role that you have been given. Everyone does that, and everyone awakens to a certain collective intelligence, but you're giving up an I in order for that flow to happen more of a biomechanical collective intelligence is you embrace the I within the we, the me within the we, and you self-organize. Who's got what gifts? Put them together in the right way, allow their geniuses to spark, but people are still working in different roles, okay? But they're working in different roles separate, sorry, they're, they're still separate from one another. 
there it's like you're in your department i'm in my department she's in my department you know we're all in our different departments okay doing our thing we space is the dropping away uh this is the ability for a group to enter into the unknown together and there's all sorts of relational practices uh, this is like common knowledge. When I was, you know, 10 years ago, this was a little bit crazy sounding. Uh, but we space is basically, it's generative and it's emptying so that you can become, and oftentimes accidentally group minds emerge out of this. You empty out enough with a group of people that new wisdom can start coming through you. Okay. Now group mind is basically it's, it's a coalescing of the, uh, formless aspect of the we space into actionary steps. So, um, I've got, uh, I was saying to Peter on this call, I was like, I'm trying to like say the things and everything I could talk about for like four hours each sentence I'm saying. So bear with me here. Um, what did I just say? Group mind. So I don't want to spend all my time trying to find my examples. Um, but basically they're different. Learn that they're different play in the spaces with how they're different and recognize that they serve different purposes, but not one of them is worse than the other. So after many years of doing this, experimenting with this, having it go amazingly right and having it go really, really wrong, um, I also learned that this group mind process that I described, the ground, the channel, the map maker, the challenger, this, the whatever else it is, also just goes on in your head. So each one of us as individuals are doing all five of those processes, okay? Taking the formless into the form. And that's really, really important as well. So I'm going to stop talking now and we can have some questions and I'm sure we can dive in uh, to interesting things. Cool. Um... So uh, we're, we're scheduled for 75 minutes in total. So like 15 minutes after uh, the hour, I start putting your questions in the chat right now. I'll call on you. Um, okay. and, uh, and, and let me know if you want to pivot to an exercise near the end. Um, uh, Ali, I'll, I'll let you know when we're near the hour mark. So uh, Evan, you are up. Yeah, so you actually kind of uh, got to the first part of my question with that last statement you made about the internal aspects of this model. So I'll just read the whole question, though, and see where you want to take it. So I said this model is really resonating with my understandings derived from long years of various strange practices. It seems that you're gesturing at a model which works in a somewhat scale invariant way and that we can apply it internally as well as with groups of humans. So on the internal aspect, I've found that many of the failure modes you've mentioned so far can be minimized if you allow your different sub-selves to dance between the five roles from time to time, such that none becomes addicted to the pros or sick of the cons of one of the roles. So I would like to hear your thoughts on this aspect and specifically the dancing between roles and or the internal application of this model or process. Yeah, so that's great. Um, love this. So the dancing between roles. Um, so my mother used to be part of a, a group type meditation group in like the 80s or 70s or something. And her teacher, the guy kind of running the whole show, said to her, Darlene, I like to work with you because you can move between all the roles. Everyone else here is stuck in their single role. I think there's something happening. I think there's something like neurologically happening. Um, 
where a lot of people are able to move between a lot of the roles, uh, that they're actually capable of it. Um, you can take this to a very deep extreme. So what happens is we end up with like this I'm going to say like this reflexive self-identity mechanism that happens where we are in a certain we 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 are a certain way people reflect back to us you're so great or you're so terrible in being this way and we end up taking on this um identity this very subtle concretization into this is who I am. This is um, super dangerous uh, if you want this type of process to work. Because especially now that many of us are able to play different roles, the role, I'm used to being the channel, but I've got some folks in my membership, they're channels. I have to be the ground for them, okay? And then parts of my identity get all shattered because I'm like, I wanna be the person that everyone's paying attention to, okay? Or the quiet person becomes identified with being the quiet wise person Okay, and they're afraid of challenging or asking questions when it's coming through them. Okay, so what I'm pointing to here is that this is like really serious. This is uh, maybe I'll, I'll write the, I'll say the models that I went through. This is where like actual, um, like a, a serious meditation or Buddhist path or whatever your, your religious practice is becomes very important because you really do need to have the capacity to let go of these self-assertions and identities that you have or want to have or have been projected onto you so that you can move into these different states depending on who is around you. This also then points to a self-selection process. So you have to start to trust that the people who are gathering are gathering for a reason, okay? Meaning you also have to trust that the people who are choosing to leave or getting kicked out in whatever unconscious way is also happening for a reason, okay? These energies have to be coalescing together and working together in the right way. So this is where at a certain point, like I won't run a circle more than five people if I have the opportunity. Why? Because the insights flow when five of us are in there. Get six of us in there and there's always it, it always just doesn't quite. So now I'm like always working on getting at least 10 to 12 people in my groups, okay? But what, what this means is if you have, for example, a group of 30 people or 100 people, you need to let it self-organize into the smaller groups, okay? And I'm loving that people are nodding their heads because you're tracking something in your own life that this is making sense on but this is like you know traditional hierarchical teachers and leaders don't like this it freaks them out right it freaks them out because they feel abandoned they feel dropped they feel left they like these are personal things that get triggered and then it stops the collective intelligence from emerging uh Sometimes I just say, collective intelligence is simply love unobstructed. It's the natural thing <laughs> that happens 
when we just get out of the way, <laughs> okay? But part of the beauty of this process is you're constantly in the way. You're constantly getting digested and thrown out and, and re, remade, okay? Because you are not, what, 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 what the difference is, is you're not walking around being puppeted. You are engaging, okay? This is, a, this is an individual and collective engagement with the ideation process or the, the source process. So I had a quick follow up to that. Um, so I, I, yeah, everything you just said. Yeah, I, I agree with. I, I'm curious, um, specifically something you said in the first part of your response um, regarding the importance of doing your own work to be able to get out of the way of arising, right? So for me, you know, I, um, I sort of stumbled into these dynamics after about, you know, 15 years of mainly Vajrayana style practice with a bunch of other weird shit and psychedelics thrown in. And I'm, I'm not sure if we have 15 years for everybody, um, you know, to, to, to do a process of that length, which, uh, you know, in, in order to harness this group intelligence to solve a lot of the problems that we all see around us and that are pretty critical. So not trying to insert artificial urgency, but recognize what seems to be around us. I'm curious if you have thoughts on, say, one, the minimum viable level of uh, any way to describe that for people to be able to participate in a process like this in an effective and, you know, maybe loving is a good word way. And, and two, any thoughts about the most effective ways for people to reach that level um, without having to take 15 or 20 years? Yeah, uh, the Mondo Zen process for pointing out pure awareness, uh, very quick pointing out instructions. So what that means is the minimum. So first of all, this is great. Thank you, Evan. I'm less stressed about trying to cover all of the things that feel important. You are bringing forward the things that are important. Uh, you have to be able to disidentify with the arisings in your system. The thoughts, the narratives, the conclusions, the, the, the mind forms, the mind models that you love, the emotions, the trauma, the everything, okay? This is basic Buddha Dharma. Um, I guess you would say you have to have had stream entry. The thing is, is I know a lot of people that have hit this without practicing Buddha Dharma, they've actually just hit it through circling or theater. Uh, and I came, I come from a theater background and that's a whole other amazing topic of conversation. One of the reasons why I got really intrigued when I was listening, uh, to the Stoa on a podcast in April, many months ago, I said, what is going on here? So minimum viable, um, basically stream entry, and I'm not interested in duking out definitions. When I say stream entry, I am interested in one's capacity to be disidentified with the form and phenomena that is in fact arising, okay? And then ideally being able to rest in the recognized awareness of spaciousness. I'm not going to unpack that any further. The next thing is Okay, I'm going to give the rest of this answer teaching it in a different way. You've got a group of people, you're sitting there in a circle. Everyone is really focused and we're really into it 
and we're talking and we're listening and the challenges are happening and this channeling is happening and it's all happening. And then somebody says something and something in you is like, what did they just say? And then someone else has this subtle like, wait, did something just happen? Am I, did, uh, so now what's happened is the, the space has dissipated. We went from all being together to this pop. And what happens, I love that people are nodding, is then everyone gets really discombobulated and leaves and they have like some sort of weird breakdown and it's like everyone's on M and is like, oh, what's going on? Or someone says, did you notice that we all just kind of like got separated? And one of two things happens. The very pointing out of the disconnection brings coherence back to the space and you are able to continue on. Or two, we identify that we have to actually deepen into whatever that disconnect was because there is a relational like short circuit or like something not strong enough to contain the energy and you and that person have to work it out. Okay, whether it's intellectually by just like, oh, I misunderstood you, you said this, oh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I got your reality now, great, back to the space. Or it's like, you kind of always do this. This is like the way that you show up in groups. I could, right, and it gets into this interpersonal thing of like projection and transference and unpacking and history and what all of that is. Until you can get to a, an actual place of neutrality between those two colliding spots, you're not going to be able to get back to the group download. This is basically why I've had to like start from zero in, in, in my memberships, because I have to get people trained and able to do this stuff. <laughs> okay, biomotive framework. It freaking works okay but what's more important is having everyone in a group have that shared modality okay so now you need to have the internal structures taking place in each one of us so that all of us have the same internal scaffolding that we can build that bridge on stand on it and then link that bridge with enough of the same internal scaffolding you can then start to map together people's different internal scaffolding and sense make that right? It's like I found my friends here. So uh, you either quickly note and name, oh, I'm just in this projection, you're in this projection, and we're in that pattern of unfolding. We can just put that aside. It's acknowledged. We're going to go back to the group. Or the process gets disrupted, and you have to actually do the unpacking. So minimum viable, uh, not only do you have to have basically the stream entry or the disidentification, you also have to have a functional and actually useful working model of self-understanding and clearing. And then ideally shared between all people, but it doesn't have to be. Christian, you had a question. Yeah, and I'm a little late to this, so forgive me if I'm treading uh, stuff that was already covered or not understanding the terms you're using very well. But my question is about the, the channel archetype that you mentioned a bit and which was mentioned in the chat. And I'm wondering if it's important to construct identity to some extent, or to be able to hold the identity that's projected onto you when you are the channel. Um, and I ask that especially as someone who, I have a proclivity for the deconstruction aspect of things. And I think I can play a lot of the other archetypes pretty well, but when it comes to channeling, uh, I feel like it's harder for me to hold 
a steady identity. It feels. Yeah. yeah so I would let go. So if the word identity is coming to you and then that's what you got to work with then go work with that, go do your clearing, figure out what am I afraid of, of being the channeler? It's the focus of attention. It's, you know, blah, 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 blah. But more than that, I would actually get you to feel your body and your nervous system. In particular, if you're, if I'm speaking straight to you, if you're struggling as a channel, you probably have actually blocks in your nervous system that aren't capable of circulating like the electrical field or whatever it is. And so you're going to want to work on that. And that's just as important as the identity piece, like the self concept. But if you're having self concept issues, you just, you do work around it. And what can you do? You can go into a collective space <laughs> and do like a group Nadura process or whatever to uncover the thing that's blocking you around being a channel. And maybe you'll end up in some story about a past life and don't be identified with past lives because it's just a construction and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And the, the energetic aspect of it is, is a real thing. It, do you see that there's like um, a relation between those two sides of it? The, the allowing identity to be projected on you and the maybe possible blockages in the energy system? Yeah. You just moved on my screen. Yeah, totally. So it's, it's like the thing about being disidentified is that you can then ultimately identify with anything. If you're disidentified with everything, you can identify as anything. That's the fool in the tarot. That's the actor. That's the, the magician. So if you're unable to take the projection, you're identified with something. You're not disidentified with something, right? Which means you're rejecting what's happening. Now, guys, there are so many subtleties in this. Like, no self, self-concepts, therapeutic clearing, energy capacities, circulating life force like there's so much in this um what am i saying when i say that i guess don't leave here today thinking, oh, I got it, okay? And then start mapping it on to like, this person in my life is like this, and this person in my life is like this, and blah, 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 because that is the exact opposite of what this process is. But it's the thing that the mind wants to do, okay? And you, you absolutely can and will end up stuck in a trap, and you will lose all your friends, just joking. Um, but, but be careful. Uh, I'm, yeah, Oof. there's something in me that's, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. All right. Um, Cole T, you're up next. Thank you. Let me. I'm not going to phrase it the same way I typed it, so I'm going to find it. Okay, I was really curious how social distancing or not physically gathering has affected your group practicing, because I don't think technological mediation inherently disrupts connect collective intelligence, but it does feel different and it is affecting the way that we, our own psychology and neuroplasticity as it becomes a greater part of culture. So I was curious if you could comment on the distinctions or similarities in your practice online and your in-person practice. Yeah, first and foremost, it does work online. 
Secondly, it's a lot easier in person. Um, I think it's fair to say that people that I've worked with that have experienced it in person are able to kind of drop in and go there much more readily and easily online than the people that I'm having to teach just online. I'm in the same inquiry. I'm in this same inquiry. Um, on, on the one hand, it's like this type of group mind, we space, collective intelligence works. It's like this is it's like this is pointing to like the original internet of the mind. Um, and I don't know. I'm with you in there. I'm with you. And, and this would be like a great, like if we were to try to cultivate more of a we space, I'd be having everyone unmute themselves and have you guys just like name the interesting things that are standing out to you and the different parallels, you know, and we would kind of just like toss it into the space without any coherent narrative you know, and then from there, three or four things would stand out and we would slowly start to kind of work with them in a more coherent way. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. I don't know. <laughs> so, so we're approaching the top of the hour. Um, do you want to continue with questions until the end or do you want to switch to something else? Let's do questions if there's if there's lots of questions. Um, and I think I will invite myself and everyone to um, take a breath and uh, just see. Just be with my silence for a second here. So see if as we're slowly deepening into this silence that we can we kind of call upon the lower or the deeper or more the depth intelligence that's sitting in the space between us all? With both the trusting and the recognition that what you're bringing, be it question or insight, is in fact inherently needed and required for the intelligence to actually begin to move through us in a deeper way. and honoring that every single person on this screen actually literally has some sort of piece of some sort of puzzle here that's bigger than what I can even ask a question about.
and to set the intention that upon leaving, that you stay in relationship with that knowing. That, that you are bringing something that is needed for that urgency that I think Evan politely pointed to earlier. And that it is in fact possible for us to start self-organizing into groups and pods to take action. And trust your capacity for first person relating, knowing your experience, or your capacity for second person relating, dropping into someone else's experience, or your capacity for third person relating, making it objective, finding some sort of sense-making apparatus for objectivity, or your capacity for fourth person relating, entering into the unknown with others, or your capacity for fifth person relating, taking the unknown into form. So we can continue with the questions. You might feel super dropped in or you might feel giddy. You don't need to be any particular way from here on out, but do your best not to abandon nor avoid stillness if in fact you have just accessed it. Do you sen uh, sense it's wise to pivot to more popcorn style of people just unmuting themselves or should we stick to the Q and A format. Sure. Yeah. If that can cool. work, let's do it. I notice that as I'm trying to feel into that stillness and sense of coherence and let's say um, the equally shared importance uh, of our presence here, whatever that is, that there's a part of me that's a little bit anxious that wants to make sure everybody's on board. And it's almost, um, and it's my ability to get into a deeper place of stillness, wondering, is, it, is everyone else there? Are we leaving anyone behind? Beautiful noting, beautiful structure for internal awareness, yeah. We could check into that and work with everyone's yays or nays towards this proposition I made. Alexandra, mm -hmm. hi. Um, something that's been coming up for me for weeks as I've explored some of the collective presencing practices here, formally on the still or adjacent, and just my relationship to groups in general, I'm constantly feeling around that. And I have a long history of enjoying like channeled entities. So that's all very familiar and, and real and viable for me. Um, when it comes to collective presencing in any group, what comes up is like, what is this group about? Like, why am I syncing up with these people and what are we trying to receive? And I've actually bowed out of different groups because that deep why was not present in me. And, um, I don't feel like others necessarily need to like supply that to me. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm curious what, like in your groups, you get a group of people together and you're presencing something like, do you have an inquiry? Is it like a, a 
setting the space for some kind of action how is that determined like I feel like if I had a group of like flesh and blood like good friends and we got together I would know that like there's love here we're building a life together and we're going to presence around that but it's like there are other presencing groups I've been kind of invited to and I like being invited part of me wants to be included but this this why this what what are we really up to keeps coming up so this is the first time I've spoken it to a group and to someone like you so it's part of my process and thank you yeah that's uh beautiful and and thank you for naming that and that's um huge so once you have a space of people that are basically i'm going to say the space is opened as my mother would say i like to say now we're going to put an idea in the center and without attachment what's coming up for us Okay, you can put the, if you're running a business and you have a bunch of people that can do this running a business, you can put the dilemma in the center. Why is it that no one's showing up? And what that's doing is that's, that's, that's giving something for the energy to coalesce around, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's giving a certain direction into form, right? And then we can start examining from all of these different angles. When you don't have that, you can, that's, both of them are of value, okay? Um, but basically you're just entering into a blown out space where there's, uh, I'm gonna say, energy being generated and expanse being generated, but it needs to ultimately end up getting directed. Okay, and so it feels like you're feeling into that. You're, you've been hanging out in the formless and you're like, I need this to manifest as something. I need, I need this to become like, something that actually changes the world, for example, not just a bunch of us hanging out, you know? So I don't know, I, I'm not necessarily answering your question directly, but I'm naming what's coming up for me. Um, and I'm trusting that process. Uh, and I'm also trusting, this is where I've really come to appreciate like, For the people who can just hang out in that endless boundless we space and keep generating that and keep generating that and keep generating that awesome let that be their gift let that be their contribution right new people come in they experience it they do whatever but some people let them leave and take it to whatever next level of formation is desired right um and I, we've, I, we've done this, I've, we run workshops where we basically start off in vast open inquiry and by the end of it, we've got a to-do list, you know, and it's wonderful. And that's how I like to work. That's what excites me. Um, but there's, there's power at each stage. Thank you. It feels good to just speak what has been coming up and hear your response. And I don't necessarily need like a solid solution, but it at least is not rattling around in my head. And I can be a little more clear as I choose to participate. Yeah, beautiful. And like I can, I can name even for me, it's like me actually slowing down and enter into the space with you guys, right? And actually be able to like 
meet you where you are. I'm still having to get there a little bit. Here we are. I'd like to respond to that a little bit. I'm part of a collective dreaming group that has built a really delicious uh, collective scaffolding for us to all play in each other's dream spaces. Um, without getting too much into that methodology, some of the things I've taken away from that for being in collective spaces and moving from inquiry to manifestation do come in with a willingness to get a little more specific about who you're dreaming with. And while still meditating, trying to find a shape or form for the other person's consciousness in the form of offering them a gift. And this comes into a little bit of narrative building that can be a slippery slope into coming out of the space. But in terms of finding a purpose and a why, I think it's a good practice because it helps you start to um, grow your practice of imagination and grow the practice of a collective purpose with those other people um, that seems like it could start to put you into new territory of both relating to the question and relating to the other consciousness. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love that. And um, it's, all, it's also what's coming up is it's, it's a form of just directing the sub minds. It's, it's a form of directing all of your sub minds and everyone else's sub minds in a singular direction but that direction opens up to the endless kind of possibility, which you're just pointing to as well. It's like you're able to actually end up in the endlessness when everyone's moving in the same direction. Thank you. What, uh, can you hear me? Thanks. Uh, what comes up uh, to me when we're talking about this? Um, I've explored. Um, I, I'm, I've been catching myself in the same traps, um, trying to find a purpose, and without a purpose, and without answer to the question why I'm somehow uh, starting to disconnect from activities. And um, so I wanted to ask a question. Um, maybe the maybe i'm or we are ideologically conditioned to need a purpose and uh to somehow uh we need like some justification of of doing or or doing is maybe the justification of our, of our being so isn't that just maybe in an uh, like a teleological itch we need to scratch uh something we maybe can unlearn um in our in our doing or is it is it inherent inherent in in, in ourselves mm. so i i think that's what I, came yeah, yeah I, I went from being like oh interesting open inquiry to oh i think is he asking a question and i might be able to respond to that what and I'm a little bit in between spaces. What, 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 uh, what's up for you in sharing that? Um, I'm sorry, it was a little bit um, hazy. I think so. so for for me, that the question was: Is it um, is it something I can unlearn? Is it something learned, like a habit, ideological habit, that I need? the purpose and I'm asking always why before I start doing something or before I start doing any, any practice is it something I can unlearn and uh, which will unlock uh, my ability to do things or just to be 
or is it something that is in inherently needed and I just need to find the purpose? What's coming up and I and I I think we would be able to kind of hash this out or sort of play this out if we had more time. But what's arriving is um, both are true. Uh, it's something to, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is an example of like, oh, don't leave here today. Like thinking you have to unlearn your need for purpose or leave here today thinking I need to create purpose, like, because it's, it's, these are deep questions, right? And they go very, very deep into who we are and, and how we live. Um, I'm going to really emphasize a word, disidentify with, not reject or throw out or need, but simply recognize that this, this is where you can go on a path of, of, of inquiry for the next three years and you know uh, join a monastery and just say, I am going to get to know myself, you know? I am, I am, you know, a practice that I had as, as a, as a female, as a young woman growing up was I'm going to be able to go without makeup. And then I'm going to do an entire Zen retreat, getting up 45 minutes early, doing my hair, putting on my makeup, making sure my nails are painted and see if I can handle that if I'm so disidentified with my identity, okay? So, so you get to catch these things in yourself and start to play. And this is why I love theater. It's a space. I say we train on the stage so in life we can play. You have a square that you get onto and suddenly anything is allowed within certain parameters. You have a container <laughs> for anything, right? And this is one of the important things of when you're in theater, you can't be narcissistic. You have to be taking care of the group. If you're in improv, you have to be with the other, right? You have to be a me within the we. If you're not, the play does not work. The show doesn't happen. You have to be fluid. So this is an example of like big picture and then you can narrow it down to like all of these different things. Here's how to have communication. Here's how to clear my wounds around identification with identity. Here's how to be in an interpersonal space with people. Here, blah, 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 right? And you've got all of these different practices. <sighs> And, you know, for those of you who love the fool archetype, don't hate on the people who have roles. Love them. They're playing their role. Not everyone has to dance around like a wild person like you, okay? Some people are just doing their thing and they might feel rigid, but it's their thing. Let that be okay. Don't force them into some sort of growth path that you want them to on, okay? This stuff is for you to change and grow, not to make everyone else change and grow. Very cool. So um, we reached our time limit. Uh, any, any closing thoughts where we can find your work? Uh, anything you'd like to leave us with? Um, sure. So I have, I have my personal website. It's pretty vague and empty. It's originalbody.ca. And then I run a membership uh, through my dad's 
workbiomotiveframework.com. And the membership that I run, we are kind of moving between what I'm talking about here and circling practices and emotional clearing practices. So it's, it's a certain type of playground. Um, but I, I hope to start doing more, more stuff like this uh, with other folks where I don't have to like start from the very beginning. I can just kind of jump in and start playing <laughs> with you. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for coming to the store today. And uh, we'd love to have you back and engaging in an experiment uh, now that we have uh, kind of the kind of conceptual map. Uh, and it'd be cool too to have some kind of modality sex where, you know, um, Guy Sang Sok from Circling is a friend of the STOA, um, Rhea Beck from uh, um, Collective Presencing, just have like a kind of conversation. Uh, oh, actually maybe that. get into like a we space thing with with all the founders of these modalities. I think that would be quite, quite rad. Um, yeah. Cool. So, <laughs> so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll exchange an email. We'll figure that out. Um, that being said, upcoming event, we have one in about, what is it? 30 minutes, about 45 minutes, ontological design. Um, I have no idea what that is. So I have to read an article about it beforehand, but I will uh, paste, post that in the thing, the chat right now. Boom. Uh, we have a uh, stoa.ca, the stoa.ca for all our upcoming events. Uh, we have a Patreon and a Substack if you like that to check that out. That being said, Alexandra, everyone, thank you for coming to the stoa today. Thank you all.